Good evening. Welcome back to the summer series here at Crossings. We are honored that you joined us on a pretty nice July evening here in Oklahoma. And thank you all who are joining us online, especially mom and dad who always watch this. My parents currently live in Michigan, but they participate in the life of crossings via the camera. So eventually they'll move down here. But in the meantime, whether I'm related to you or not, we're just so glad to gather together. This is, um, for some of you, you're already asking, where's the other guy, the smart guy that, I, that takes questions? So Terry is off for the month of July. And so he has invited yours truly and Blake Baston to share the summer series. So I get to kick us off and conclude us, and then Blake is going to cover weeks two and three. And so we're in this series, and we are grateful for Terry to entrust this to us, and so we're glad to be together and have you all with us. And we're in this series for the month of July that is centers around the idea of the things that skeptics ask. And so we're gonna cover a variety of topics related to that, but we're not necessarily covering the run of the mill skeptic questions. Like, you know, is the ark still on Mount Ararat? and uh, and, uh, age of the earth and some of those things that are, I call them run of the mill. There's good books out there and you can dive into those kind of books that are gonna cover that. We're covering it from a slightly different angle, which is who is God and what does he want from us? These are the questions that if you kind of do the deep dive enough of those deeper questions, you'll come into contact with them. And tonight I'm covering an uh, important question, which is how can God be three and yet one? Just out of curiosity, quick show of hands, how many of you totally understand? You totally understand Trinitarian theology, right? You have this down pat, you're ready to recite the Athanasian Creed, you know this stuff, and you're, no, I don't see a whole lot of hands, and I guess online I'm sure there aren't that many hands up either. In fact, this is one of those topics, as long as I have been a pastor, which is well over 25 years now, I never spoke or taught on Trinitarian theology until two years ago. Because I kind of felt like this is heavy duty, systematic theology kind of stuff. And so when people would put me on the spot and they would say, do you really believe that God exists in three persons? Somehow is one God, not three gods? I would always say yes, because that's proper theology. But if anyone were to say, show me in the Bible, I would have said, can I get back to you? And so this has become a curiosity of mine. And I would encourage you, by the way, we all have a certain amount of time in our lives to dive into certain topics that intrigue us and perhaps no one else. And each of us have these kind of questions. And so you will not be able to, in the course of your lifetime, answer every question that you have. But if there are arenas of matters of faith, theology, things in the Bible, then make those a hobby of yours. Dive into those topics. Read broadly and read deeply on those topics. You might annoy everyone around you, but you yourself will have a satisfied thirst because at least you'll know some things. And so that's my encouragement to you, and I hope that this evening is helpful So with that being said, let's dive into this topic. What does the word Trinity even mean? The Trinity is a way of maintaining or talking about God that maintains the unity of God, the simple unity of God, that there is but one God, and yet helps give us an understanding, a language for how to comprehend that God exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And one of the brightest minds I know, my wife, she says this, that the Trinity is a mystery, not a math problem. That's actually the language that's used of this whole concept. If you've ever thought, boy, that theology is mysterious, 
Well, that's good language because early theologians would even use this terminology, a mystery. How many of you like mysteries? You watch mysteries? My wife and I watch murder mysteries. We love murder mysteries. Please don't judge me. On Friday nights, we watch Dateline, which has been pointed out by many that it's just a show about guys who kill their wives and try to get away with it. It never works, by the way. Dateline gets you. Keith will find you and you'll go to jail. So don't do that. Don't commit those kind of crimes. We, but we love the mystery because it starts out and it's idyllic and how the couple met and it was sweet and they really loved each other and you know someone is killing someone, right? But by the end of it, the mystery's wrapped up and the person's incarcerated. You feel a sense of justice. You feel good about it. That's the nature of a mystery. When the mystery is first articulated, you do not know who done it. But then over time, there's these clues where you start going, I think it's this, I think it's this, I think it's this, and then the mystery is solved. Now, I will just let you know now that we're not gonna solve the mystery of the Trinity tonight. Some of you are like, well, then what is the point? Well, it's like any good mystery. You make contributions along the way so that at least you have a little more understanding and a little more understanding. And presumably someday when we as believers are with God, we'll get it. We'll understand what this whole thing is about. And so as we consider this, we need to um, kind of articulate what we're going to cover tonight. This was kind of the outline. I think this is in your handout, I'd like to point out that oftentimes Terry only gives you half a sheet. You got a whole sheet handout. Those of you online, trust me, it's a whole sheet and Terry only gives half a sheet. So it's not a competition, but I won. But here's what we're gonna cover. We're gonna cover what is the Trinity. We're gonna put some definitions and some uh, understandings around the terminology. Then we're gonna dive into what does the Bible teach about the Trinity? Because the word Trinity does not occur in the Bible. So. So what does the Bible teach anyhow that would lead us to the conclusion that God exists in three persons? Then we're going to actually dig into how to understand this idea of the Trinity because there are some imperfect metaphors that are out there, different ways to try to wrestle with this. And then we're gonna ask what difference does it make? Some of you, very pragmatic people, you're like, let's just skip to the end. Let's get to the point where this is why this matters. But it does matter. There are implications for this that are very, very helpful for us. Now, some of you, you've been a believer your whole life, and maybe that's quite a number of decades. And you might wonder, you know, I've gone this long without wrestling with this issue. And I've never even bumped into a skeptical friend who's asked about this issue. So what? Why would I want to do this? Well, let me suggest to you that understanding Trinitarian theology will help you grow in your depth of appreciation for who God is. So you might have a warm and loving relationship with God, but this is just going to enhance that. Many years ago, thanks to um, social media, I had two of my worlds collide. One of my longest surviving friends in ministry, a guy named Juno Smalley, that's his real name, and he pastors in Southern California. Well, Juno had a birthday, and as I often do, if I have a moment, I'll go on Facebook and I'll, I'll wish the various friends whose birthday it is a happy birthday. So when I went on his Facebook page, I saw that my cousin wished him a happy birthday. And I thought, now that's odd. Why would my cousin know Juno? Juno and I are colleague pastors, and Juno lives across the country. He at one time administered in Michigan, but I thought, now how does he know my cousin? So I called Juno up and I said, hey, I'm wishing you a happy birthday. How do you know Tara and Lauren? And he goes, oh, I officiated their wedding. I was at their wedding. I was at their wedding five years before I met Juno. I somehow had not quite put together the guy who officiated their wedding was the guy who became a very close friend of mine. Now, in my defense, that's because Juno had changed some of his facial hair situation. At the wedding, he looked a little bit like Burt Reynolds. Big, bushy mustache. The only thing he was missing was a Trans Am. But 
as time went on, he trimmed that thing and he grew out a beard so he looked different. But once I put that together, I thought, this is wonderful. And then I got the chance to talk to him as well as my cousins about the nature of that relationship. And as it turned out, Juno had discipled them and invested in my cousins. And that's why he ended up officiating the wedding. And so here's this guy that meant a great deal to me who had meant a great deal to my cousins. And it just, it made the relationship richer and more warm. And my guess is you have some similar kind of story that you might learn something about a dear friend and it goes a little deeper. And your friendship hasn't been dramatically altered but there's a maturing and there's, a, there's a, a beautiful benefit. So if you needed further motivation other than the chairs are comfortable and the room is air conditioned and you're already here, there is another reason. This will enrich your relationship with God. So let's start with uh, question one. What is the Trinity? The Trinity, it's a, a noun in case you're wondering which part of speech it is. And it's from a Latin, Trinitas. And so the Latin expression is the meaning of threeness or threefold. Not three separate things, but it's a way of talking about three, but kind of one, but sort of different and distinct. And what the term Trinity, why it became more and more popular, is to discuss theologically this idea that God is of a substance that is unique and that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Greek term for this is homoousius. So ousius would be the substance and homo would be the same. So the homoousius, the, the same substance, yet three distinct persons. And so the word which migrated from Latin into English was used to describe what we in classical theolo theological circles call the Godhead. Now, the very first time the word Trinity shows up is not in the Bible. As I already mentioned earlier on, and sometimes people criticize and say, why do we even use terms that aren't in Old or New Testament? Well, we use these terms to help us understand what we are reading in that Old and New Testament. And in this case, the very first time that the word Trinity appears in written form as it relates to God is from a early church father. And the early church father's name is Theophilus of Antioch, and it's in a letter he wrote to Autoclus. How many of you have read that letter already? No? Not that many. You can. It's free online. You can Google this and you can double check my work. It's quite interesting. The early church fathers, incidentally, this one was written about 175 AD. The early church fathers, or sometimes they call them the anti Nicaean fathers. Not that they're against Nicaea, but anti is an old Greek word for before, and Nicaea is a council in the town of Nicaea. So this is the fathers. Sorry, ladies, there were no mothers that we've kept their writing. And isn't that like the sexist world we live in? The women's work doesn't get recorded. Well, those are different times. We live in different times today. But these early church fathers, the Antinician fathers, this Theophilus is one of them. And Theophilus, he's the first that we know of. And this is the first in print that we see it. And the words go like this. In like, he's talking about creation. In like manner, the three days of creation before the luminaries, in other words, before the sun and the moon and the stars were created, are types of the Trinity. God, his word, that would be Jesus, and his wisdom. And in the early church fathers, they would use Jesus' word, which is in the New Testament, and they would refer to the wisdom of God in reference to the Holy Spirit. And so what he was trying to do is he was trying to use a descriptor, shorthand, if you will, to describe the phenomenon that they were trying to explain that they saw in the Bible. So while the word Trinity doesn't occur in the Bible, it was a way of not having to always say the eternal Godhead who perpetually exists in three persons is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, or we could just go with Trinity. It's sort of like you could spell out Oklahoma, 
but okay is okay with me, right? And so this was just shorthand to get to the point. And what was it they were trying to get to? They were trying to get to this understanding of a few things that they read in the Bible. When we come into the New Testament, here is the Great Commission. This is from the words of Jesus Christ. Matthew 28, 19. Jesus says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that verse alone was a troubling verse. Because Christianity comes out of Judaism or the Jewish religion, the Hebrew religion, and the Hebrew religion was strict monotheist. There is but one God, and there is no sub-God, and there is no secondary to God. There is but one God, and you shall have no other gods before him, and you shouldn't even put another pseudo-God even on the same parallel with him. And then Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. And when you do it and you baptize them, you baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And something that would have never occurred to an Old Testament believer was to pray to anyone but the Lord God Almighty. Now he revealed himself in different Hebrew names, but that would have been clear. They would have never said a prayer to an angel. They would have never, in fact, when they said prayers to other deity type things, God was not pleased with them. And so for Jesus to say, go and you baptize so that people have an allegiance to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now this was a puzzle. They were trying to make sense of this. And of course, we read it in the writings of the Apostle Paul. Here's just one example in 2 Corinthians Chapter 13, verse 14, Paul says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Which once again was a puzzle because you are putting Jesus and the same sentence equal to God and equal to the Holy Spirit. And so the early believers said, well, God is revealing something about himself that's new. And then, of course, Peter himself, uh, he, he says, and this is his first letter, 1 Peter 1, verses 1 and 2, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the province of modern-day Turkey is the arena in which he had written, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of who? God the Father. Through who? The sanctifying work of the Spirit by to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be with yours in abundance. And, and so um, it was obvious that God is being addressed as Father, as Son, as Holy Spirit. And the early church writers, they began to wrestle with how do we talk about these things? And what happened was a divergence of thinking, or what I might call competing theological explanations. So the technical term for it is heresies. And to call someone a heretic or that that's heretical today is either laughable or rude, but it's neither of those things. Uh, the old word just meant a point of view that someone had taken. And it became more and more used as those who had taken a point of view that was divergent from the proper theological view. And two of the most popular views, the first one went by three different names. There's slight distinctions, but for our purposes tonight, we'll just umbrella them all together, is uh, Sabellianism, named after a guy who made it popular, Sibelius. He didn't come up with it, but he was a good marketing genius, so it got named after him. And it was a a view that others will call monarchianism. And in oh, about 150 years ago, a German guy said, let's call it modalism. And you might've heard that. Be, and here's what's helpful about modalism. Modalism explains what the thing is. 
And what those early church writers began to wrestle with is how do we describe that God reveals himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but it's one God. How can he be one God? How could the Father be in heaven and the Son be on earth and the Spirit be wherever the Spirit is and yet still be one and not be in three different places? Isn't that three different gods? No, it can't be three different gods. And so Sibelius popularized the notion that God shifts into modes, so it's sort of like I have a button on my car that I occasionally accidentally hit, and it has an S on it for snow, which would have been very helpful in my home state of Michigan, and it is helpful here about three hours once a year. And so it is a different mode, which a different traction control. It's sort of like that, but it would go like this. There was God, the Father, and then he sends himself and now he's here on earth as the son. There isn't God in heaven because he's here in this mode. And then he ascends into heaven and he sends himself back as the Holy Spirit. He goes from the mode of creator God, Lord of the universe, to suffering servant who dies for us. And then he ends up the spirit that resides in the believers. And as the Sabellian followers began to distribute pamphlets on this and they were in Bible studies and Sunday school classes and they were discussing this. There were other, there were other people going, nah, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't, I mean, why would Jesus pray to himself if he was there and there was only one of them? I mean, there were times where Jesus went alone to pray to the Father, but if the Father is him, well then how could he pray to himself? That doesn't, that doesn't make sense. And so there was a, a movement back from that. Then there was a second way of understanding this, and this centered around the person and the work of Jesus. And in the coming weeks, Blake's going to talk about Jesus, the incarnation, and all this. But, but for our purposes tonight, Arian theology, not to be confused, if you know history of the 20th century, there was a lunatic in Germany that was nuts about the Arians. That's not the group. It's a different spelling and a different group. Arian is from a guy named Arius, and Arius said, you know, there was a time when Jesus was not. You know, he, he was made by the Father. He was uh, either maybe a super angel, or he, he, at least he was of the created order, and then the Father imbued him with deity, but, but there was a time when he didn't exist. That's what Arian theology taught. And the early church kind of, again, they would, in Sunday schools and Bible studies and from pulpits, and there were some fans of these points of view. They were popular enough that, that we still have the writings of these things. There's, a, there's a, a skeptical notion out there that the church suppressed all this stuff. Well, the church preserved all this stuff. Well, that's where the documents were kept. People who weren't interested in church didn't keep pamphlets criticizing different theological positions. They set fire to those things. It was church people that kept it. So, so the whole notion, I, I won't ask for a show of hands because we'll have to have everybody down at the altar to repent later. But there was a popular book and movie series that came out by an author named Dan Brown some years ago. It was called The Da Vinci Code. And many of us saw it. I did see it. I was curious. And I was like, well, it was a terrific bit of fiction. But there wasn't a shred of truth in it because part of the, the assumption of the author, which, by the way, non-Christian historians have criticized that work as a work of incredible fiction. Because even people who don't believe in Christianity can look at that work and go, it's catchy, it's interesting. But here's the reality. In the first three centuries, four centuries, the church was so decentralized and so disorganized, there wasn't a power structure that could send memos out and say, suppress this, stop this, burn this. That's not how it worked. What happened was, is in your Sunday school class or your small group or in your church, you'd hear these things. And if you had a copy of the Bible, you'd do your own investigation and you'd just say, as the kids say today, that doesn't track. That, that's not how that works. And so theologically, they would hear these things and they would say, that, now that's not true. Now to be sure, there were bishops or spiritual overseers of prominent towns in the remnants of the Roman Empire that would stand up and they would write whole books defending 
Orthodox Christianity and they would do it against what they called heresy. One of the most prominent is a man named Athanasius. And here's a, a woodcut. I love this one in particular. If you, go, if you Google Athanasius, you know, it's three, four photographs and good artwork. So this is just a kind of an, a rendering. Athanasius is one of the most fascinating figures in the early church. He lived in the three, four hundreds AD and Athanasius had a nickname. You know what his nickname was? In Latin, it's Athanasius Contra Mundum. That's his nickname. Do you know what contra means? Against. Do you know what mundum is? The world. It was Athanasius against the world. The world was against Athanasius and he stood apart. So here is this picture and what you see kind of off to his, uh, I think it is his, yeah, his left there, you see men with spears on horses coming through. He's in the middle because he was banished he was banished by the Roman Empire three or four times. On numerous occasions, they went hunting for him because he stood up for right theology. But the right theology actually wasn't in the position of power. The Arians were in the position of power. Now, this puts a common misconception right on its head. Here's the misconception, or here's the skeptical point of view. The church has always been a power broker. It has not. And that the people, they were the ones, they had an agenda about this theological framework and they drove everybody else out. They killed them, wiped them out. Actually, in the first few centuries, the opposite was true. Arian had, Arius, he had the ear of the emperor. And the emperor was a great one. His name was Constantine. You might have heard of him. And Constantine, as this great emperor, he had concerns about the schisming of his empire. He had fought to pull it all together. He had converted to Christianity at the time. Historians debate whether it's sincere, and there's no point in debating. God knows if we meet him, he was. And if we don't, either you're not or he's not. So either way, we'll find out but we'll find out down the road. But Constantine had the ear of the, or the Arians had the ear of Constantine. So he pulls together a council. The council's in a town called Nicaea. And the council, or the, the, is in that town. So the Nicaea Creed is from that council. How many of you grew up reciting the Nicaea Creed? Any of you still have it memorized? There's a few of you who are like, yes, I do. Thank you very much. A couple of you might even have it in Latin if you're old enough. But the idea of the Nicene Council was they had to come to grips with how to describe the Trinity. And the Arians almost won the day. But through persuasion, not through power, there was a shift and we ended up with or the proper theology was articulated. Now I have to take us on a little detour because there's an apocryphal story that shows up almost every Christmas and it's one of my favorite. And I say it's apocryphal because there's actually no historical reason to believe this actually happened, but I still love it because it's about jolly old St. Nicholas. You know, St. Nicholas is rooted in a saint who is a bishop in a town in modern day Turkey. And that particular St. Nicholas ended up at the Council of Nicaea. And that particular bishop, he believed in orthodox theology. He was a firm believer in it. And according to the stories, he came into contact with Arius. And here is one artistic rendering of it. So I want you to sing with me. Jolly old St. Nicholas punched a heretic. No, I think it would add something by way of flavor to the song. Again, we don't know if St. Nick actually punched a guy. He might have slapped a guy. There's a great story around it. It exists in church history. We, it may be true. It may not be true, but I like it. I like it because St. Nick, jolly old St. Nick, he, in the story, he later apologized. He's like, I stand for what's true, but I shouldn't have punched him. I'm sorry about that. And they all forgave him. So this is a helpful understanding that proper theology was openly debated and discussed. There wasn't a smoke-filled back room 
where what we think of as Christianity was formed. No matter how many clever Instagram posts or Twitter posts are about this sort of thing, it is out in the public record. There are volumes and volumes of original source material that you can dive into, and it confirms the reality that false teaching died of natural causes, meaning it just didn't track. People heard it and they said, no, that doesn't make us, that doesn't make any sense. Now, before we move on, Arianism, which taught that there was a time where Jesus was not, that, that the father created him and lifted him up and that he did die for sure, but he died for our sins, but he was just of the created order. There is a popular modern religion that's based off this. Anyone know what it is? Mormonism. This is Mormon theology, a little bit Jehovah Witness. So sometimes when you hear these almost theologies, they're, they're, they're not new. They're, they're, they're actually quite old. Well, let's move on because I keep using the word orthodoxy and I'm concerned that I might have used a word before I defined a word and some of you know what it is. And orthodoxy as a term, the way I'm using it is the right and accepted teaching. Now, I want to clear up a confusion. Just a bit east of here, we have a lovely church, St. Elijah. It is Antiochian Orthodox. If you go a little bit further, you have the Greek Orthodox Church. Both have very fun festivals to, vi to visit at different times of the year. Great food, nice people. And in fact, I highly recommend sometime when St. Elijah's in particular is open, the the, the inside of it is absolutely beautiful and uh, absolutely lovely. I'm not using the term orthodoxy as it relates to Indian Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, uh, Eastern Orthodox, and so on. I'm using the term ortho as in ortho is right and dox is teaching, right teaching. The word heresy that I've already mentioned, that is the doctrine that disagrees with orthodoxy. Now, I just am adding one just because it's fun. There is another term called heterodoxy. And unless you travel in super theological nerd circles, you may never hear the term. But heterodoxy is just different opinions of popular beliefs. So different churches practice baptism differently. That is not a matter of heresy. That is a matter of heterodoxy, meaning differences of opinion. So... Uh, I heard Charles, Spur I read Charles Spurgeon said, orthodoxy is what I believe, heterodoxy is what everybody else believes or something to that effect. And so I, I want us to be very careful because as we talk about orthodoxy, we should never call like another denominational group heretics because they baptize infants or because they practice communion a different way. We need to be real careful with that. That is heterodoxy but it could become heresy depending. Well, we don't have time for that one and maybe I'll save that one for another day. So let's move on to question number two. Let's move past this one and go into the question of what does the Bible teach about the Trinity? And in order for us to unpack this in a systematic way, we're gonna use Thomas Oden. He was a great theologian of the 20th century. He was a Wesleyan theologian, one of the best. And Thomas Oden, in his work, Classical Christianity, provides a, a basic grid. If you are an engineer, there are certain scientific rules of engagement for how to do the work of an engineer, or an architect, or a school teacher, or a chef. There are certain ways, there are certain bullet-pointed or numbered rules that help guide a process and help one think through how to do something. So Odin's work here is helpful for us. And what we'll do is we'll look at Bible verses for each of these four. In the first, if we want to see how the Bible teaches Trinitarian theology without ever using the word Trinity, well, here it is. Each person of the Trinity is distinctly addressed by divine names. You can't use divine names of anyone but God. So each member of the Trinity, those distinctions are there. Each person of the Trinity demonstrates divine attributes. There are some attributes that all people share and there are some attributes that only God has. But each member of the Trinity 
has those attributes. Each person of the Trinity engages in actions only God can accomplish. People can't accomplish these things. And then finally, each person of the Trinity is thought worthy of divine worship. As great as your best friend is, you ought not worship them, right? And so these are the ways that we go about and we're using Odin. So with that in mind, let's look at the very first, that each person of the Trinity is distinctly addressed by divine names. Here's just three examples, and there's many. The Father is called God. This is in Galatians 1, beginning of verse 3, the Apostle Paul wrote this, grace and peace to you from God, our Father. The Son is called God. This is at the very beginning of John's gospel in the first verse, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if you just read a few sentences in, you realize he's talking about Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit is called God. This is Paul again in Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And so divine names are used of each member of the Trinity. Well, what about uh, demonstrations or assumed to have divine attributes. So eternality is a divine attribute. The Father is eternal. This is at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 21, verse 33. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he called upon the name of the Lord, the eternal God. In Matthew, Jesus, here he says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. The word for that is used there of age is I am with you to the end of eternity. I am with you. Another way of saying that is I'm with you forever and ever and ever. And then here is reference to the Holy Spirit being eternal. And this is from the writer to the Hebrews. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God. So we're dropping in kind of in the midstream of a thought, but here is the important bit, that the Holy Spirit is considered eternal. So each member of the Trinity has divine names. Each one has divine attributes. Then here's just a few verses about what each member of the Trinity Uh, engages in that only God can accomplish. And we're looking at the forgiveness of sins. Now, you can forgive a person who has violated you, but you can't forgive them for the violation that they have against God. In the book of Psalms, after David is confronted for sleeping with another man's wife, Bathsheba, getting her pregnant, and then killing the husband to cover it all up, After he says this, in his psalm of confession, he says, against you and you only, God, have I sinned. Now, I would like to stick a hand up and go, well, David, um, if I'm Uriah the Hittite, I'd be like, hey, man, what about me? You took my wife and killed me, man. You violated me. But what David, David wasn't dismissing that charge. He was noting the more significant charge. So we can forgive each other of violations, but only God can forgive us for the violations, for the rebellion, for the turning away. And so here is, uh, this is 1 Peter verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his, the Father's great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So the Father is the forgiver of the sins. But the Son also forgives. Here is Mark chapter 2, verses 5, 6, and 7. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there and they were thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like this? He's blaspheming. He can, who can forgive sins but God alone? They got it. They understood what Jesus was claiming. And then the Holy Spirit forgives sins. This is the writings of the Apostle Paul to his 
friend and one of his protégés, a pastor named Titus. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we'd done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through, the, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So you go back to the end of verse five there, through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit can forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit can forgive sins. Well, using Odin's uh, formula, the fourth idea here is that each person of the Trinity is thought worthy of divine worship. Here is the Father being worshiped. This is in John chapter four. Jesus, he's talking to the woman at the well. Yet a time's coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is worshiped and the Son is worshiped. This is in the book of Revelation. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousands. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice when they were saying, worthy is the lamb and the lamb is Jesus Christ. We know this from the context. If you read the rest of it, you will not miss that. To receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. A beautiful worship uh, expression of Jesus. And then... Finally, the Holy Spirit is worshiped. Going back to John 4 in the conversation with the woman at the well, verse 24, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Not in their spirit, but in the Holy Spirit. And so here is the simple verses. And for the sake of time, that's the ones. But if you look up, there's so many more. And so you can kind of see in the early church when they got together in their small groups and in their Bible studies and in their Sunday school classes and met for worship, they'd go, ah, boy, how, did, how does the Holy Spirit forgive sins if the Holy Spirit's not God? But we know the Father's God and we know the Son is God, so how does this all work out? Hence this language that was developed and utilized. So how do I understand now you're like, okay, all right, I see that the Bible teaches it. I know what the definition is. How do I understand it? Some people have used things like water. Water can be ice and steam and it can be liquid, but those actually fit that idea of modalism because once the water's frozen, it's not still liquid and you don't get steam out of it. Once it's steam, it's hard to freeze that. So with that in mind, St. Augustine, one of the great, great minds of the Western world, he was a bishop in North Africa. The town was called Hippo. So he wasn't like the bishop over the animal's hippo. In case you've ever wondered, like, how, does he like have a special gift with angry animals? No, 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 no. Hippo is a town. And so he said, to help us understand the Trinity, let's turn inside of a person. Think of a mental process. You see something your senses, or you taste it, or you touch it. And then your brain considers it. So let's say you, you smell a rose, but you don't see the rose, you smell it. And then you think, that smells like a rose. And then your comprehension or understanding is, well, that's just lovely. I like roses. And the thought of roses comes up, and it's the smell and the thought and this memory piece of it. But then he says, if, if that one wasn't enough, then there's the sentimental process. And we've all, I, this one will probably touch you in a different way. You remember something. Now, maybe you remember it because of the, the senses being activated. You smell something or you see something and you make meaning of it. You go, this smell makes me think of this. And then you make a decision. Let me, let me illustrate so that it's concrete. Whenever I'm out and about and I happen to get a, the aroma of secondhand cigarette smoke, I don't mean those lousy vapes. That, that's not smoking. Friends, if you're going to smoke, do it with a real cigarette, okay? I mean, do it like James Dean did it. But smoking something that looks like your iPhone is just weird 
I, I don't care if it's cool. Don't. It's not only bad for you, but it doesn't look cool. But there's nothing as cool as a cigarette. Now, I'm not suggesting you go smoke one, but I grew up in a family, extended family of smokers. My parents didn't smoke, but my aunts and my uncles, and at one time my grandpa smoked, and they, my grandparents lived in a tiny house, and we jam in the tiny house, and it was a blue haze. Your eyes were burning. Your clothes for the next three years smelled like cigarettes. But when I'm out in public and I catch a whiff of secondhand smoke, my first thought is, I miss Aunt Jean. She smoked Virginia Slims one after the other. She's proof you can be on oxygen and smoke. They tell you don't do it. <laughs> that little lady, she did it, you know? And uh, so Aunt Jean would sit there and smoke Virginia. When I smell secondhand smoke, I think Aunt Jean, I loved Aunt Jean. She was, we had a nice little relationship, you know? It was just wonderful. And so I, I, I smell the smoke, I think Aunt Jean, and then I think, I wonder how Jeff's doing, my cousin, her, her son. I'm going to send uh, his wife a message because, you know, Jeff never responds to anything. So I'll ask Pam how she's doing, you know, or how they're doing. It, but so this is like you have an experience, you make meaning of it, you make a decision. How do you draw a line between those things? Where does all that take place? Some of it's on your nose and your fingertips and your mind. And so this was Augustine's way of saying this is a, a way of understanding three and yet one indivisible, but yet not to be confused with one another because it's still Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We well, had one more. We'll cover this. Uh, one more, and this is the emotional process. You love someone or something. You just, you do. Let's just say you love someone and then you, you have a relationship with them. You interact with them, but there's something in your heart when you're around them and, and then you experience a binding connection to this person. You love them. And sometimes you, you could love them and be covenanted with them in marriage for decades and then lose them. And they're still somehow with you, right? And so you can remember them, you love them. It's all happening here. Or is it happening here? Or is it happening here? Where is it happening? And so Augustine said, this is a, a mental process. Well, for some, they're very cognitive and intellectual, and those things mean a lot to them, and some people are very artistic. And this is on the back of your sheet. This is the closest thing you're going to get to a map, okay? If you come here regularly, Terry doesn't do a lesson without at least one map. But I looked up maps on the Trinity, and it was none to be found. So this, on the other hand, is the Trinitarian knot. And just out of curiosity, how, how good is your Latin, right? Some of you can make it out because you had Espanol, so the Spanish and the Latin are somewhat similar. But you have Patros, the father, Phileos, that's the son, the F in the bottom right corner. SS is the sanctified or sanctus spirit, the Holy Spirit. And deuce, do you know what deuce means? God. Okay. And how about est? It's not estimate, by the way. It's est. That's it. What's that mean? Is. The Son is God. The Spirit is God. The Father is God. But then, did you notice on the outside are these little channels? And the channels are non-est. The Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's not the Father, and the Holy Spirit's not the Son, and the Son's not the Holy Spirit. And so this is a way of visualizing that there is one. Now, it's not perfect because the lines are really bold, and the understanding of Trinitarian theology is still one, but yet not to be confused with one another. And so this might be helpful as a bit of a puzzle. And so as we, um, as we shift to that, I want us to shift to, so what difference does it make? And some of you have been like, please, I've been waiting since the beginning for what difference does this make? Well, here's um, just one verse, and then we're gonna dive on this a little bit. This is a verse that if you've been around church any length of time, we use and abuse and maybe overuse, but it's fascinating. It's a good verse. Part of the reason it gets used all the time is because in just a very short span, a couple paragraphs, a lot is taught. 
and we can teach for literally volumes on just this. And, and so this is uh, at the very beginning of Genesis. This is how it reads. When God said, let us make mankind in our image and our like, there's a puzzle here. God is using plural pronouns. Later, we discover we're made in God's image. I mean, this is key teaching, but later Jesus will say, uh, when people ask him a question about paying taxes to Caesar, he says, give me a coin. Show me a coin. They show him a coin. It's Tiberius Caesar's face on the coin. And he says, whose face? And they say, Caesar's. And he says, well, give back to Caesar what bears his image and give to God what bears God's image. So we, we're image bearers of God. This is, the key, this is the key founding text of this. And yet, God said, let us make man and, or people in our image and our likeness. Who is he talking to? It's not the angels, because we are not made in the image of angels. And when you die, you don't become an angel. Angels are an entirely different thing, and we're different from them. They're mystified by us. We're mystified by them, but we'll never become them and they don't become us. And so we're not made in the image of angels. And, and, and so God is having an internal dialogue with himself. First person that's recorded to note this is a guy named Justin Martyr. Now we think a martyr is someone who's killed for a cause and that is true, but Justin Martyr, he was a witness. He, was, he gave testimony. That's what martyr means. And Justin, Justin Martyr, he looked at this text and he said, well, it's obvious God is having a dialogue, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as such, God is saying, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make people in our image, in our likeness. Now, this is profound teaching. And this is why Trinitarian theology matters, not to help us better understand this passage, but actually as we understand God better, we understand ourselves better. And so I offer a few takeaways. Here is um, takeaway number one. Uh, we, we are creative because we are made in the image of a God who is a creator and is creative. You know, one of the most fascinating things um, about humans as that we create. You can give a monkey a typewriter and it will not write its memoir. But you give a human a hammer, they're gonna rebuild a house. How many of you watch home improvement shows? At least at some point in your life you've watched. Uh, here's a better question. How many of you gone down to Waco? How many, come on, don't be shy. Yeah, a few of you are like, I went to Waco. I, you know, Chip and Joanna, they have arrived. They don't just have a TV show and a magazine and they have furniture and furniture stores. They have a whole section in Target. I mean, that's when you know you've hit the big time. But the reason people tune into the show is they take perfectly good houses that people can live in. Some of them, maybe not. But most of the time they take homes that just look a little bit weathered, worn, dilapidated, but the roof's still there. There's appliances that still work, but it doesn't look like it's special. And they tear it right down to the studs. They shiplap something. And the next thing you know, it is a stunning house that looks brand new, absolutely gorgeous thing. Why do we renovate perfectly good things? There's something inside of us that is just, a, we're creative people. We, we go from, I, I love vivid color to I like agreeable gray, and it happens overnight. Some of you have been around long enough that you lived in a house with open shelves that you put cabinets on only to take them down to open shelf it again. We create. Some of you have traded in a car that was a great car because a new one came out. Now, I'm not mocking any of this. Uh, that, Birds have lived in the same stupid nest from the very beginning. There is not, I, we had a group, of, we had some robins that perched in a little spot and they raised their little babies. It was sweet. We loved watching it. We could see it. I have to climb a little ladder to look down in the nest. But you know, when the robins come back, they didn't ask for a condo this time. They didn't make the whole thing out of different types of branches. The animal world doesn't, it is not made in God's image. 
It's important and we should steward it, by the way, but it isn't equal. We are made in God's image. And as such, we create and we recreate and we note things and we say, this is beautiful and this is not beautiful. This is part of being made in the image of God. It was God himself who first said, I'm gonna make the world and I'm gonna make people to populate the world, but the people are gonna be in my image. So we make worlds, we settle towns, we build cities. It's kind of what we do. We did not get that from some strange place. Cultural anthropologists can explain a few things, but they can't really explain all these things. But they're much more explainable when we think of our heavenly creator. Well, the second is that you are made to relate in community. I've heard some people say, uh, I think it was uh, Blaise Pascal said, we're made with a God-shaped hole inside of us. And he's borrowing some thoughts from Ecclesiastes. But we are made with a people-shaped hole in us. In the very beginning story, if we go back to Genesis, the first time God says something's not good, it's because man is what? What's wrong with the first person? He's alone. The very, some of you are like, well, it was a man, actually, the first problem. If it was a woman, then everything would have been good. But no, that's not proper theology. If the first person created was a woman, it wouldn't have been good for her to be alone. It wasn't good to be alone. How come? It'd be because God exists, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in an eternal community, and we're made in the image of the one who lives perpetually in community. God has no needs because he already exists in this community. And so it's normal when we feel lonely that actually is part of our engineering and wiring. We need other people. I love the Eagles. How many of you like the Eagles? You know that band? Well, one of my favorite songs in high school was Desperado. That was a good one. Partly because they had a cowboy theme to it, but the whole idea, he's been out riding fences for so long now, right? It was so good. He could be out there by himself. And then you listen to it again and you look at the lyrics and you realize this is a sad, depressing song, which is kind of the music that goes along with it because we're not built and engineered to go it alone. And we didn't get that wiring from, that's not a result of sin. That's not a fault. That is hardwired into us. And when we try to live in isolation, we're desperately unhappy. Well, let me... Uh, conclude with this. The other takeaway is that we create, we crave relating to the Trinitarian God. One of the strongest to me arguments for the idea that we're made in the image of a God who exists perpetually as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is deep inside of us. We have this idea, we have this standard of what a father should be. I have three kids if I gave each of them a journal and said from their birth, write down every time you've been disappointed in me, I would have bought them a lot more journals, right? And if you're a dad, you've sure, I'm sure your kids would fill up journals. There's, it's normal and natural for us to either as dads feel disappointed in ourselves or a certain disappointment. Where does, that, where does that standard of expectation come from? Because there is a perfect heavenly father that no earthly father measures up to. Doesn't mean a dad shouldn't try, but the whole idea here is that we in our hearts know there should be a father who looks after us. And it doesn't matter how old you get, where's that idea come from? And along with it, there's this feeling there should be an older brother, an older brother who plows that road before you, who, um, who has uh, the, the courage to look after you and the strength to look after you. My, uh, my sister's four years older than I am, so that meant when I was hit in my freshman year of high school, she was off to her freshman year of college, which also meant there was no overlap there was no older sibling to kind of pave the way for me 
in high school. And I did have some friends that did enjoy that. And I was so jealous of them. But in all areas of life, to have an older sibling who's been there and done that with an arm around you, there's a craving there. How come? Because we look around at other people. No, I, I look around at other people and they've got messed up families. I don't want to be like them, right? Some of us have uh, older siblings or siblings that we have seen and our friends are like, I don't want anything like that. But there's, uh, for some reason, I think there should be. And then there's this idea that I, there ought to be someone who comforts us, that's an advocate for us. This idea, it didn't come from the, uh, the lawyer ads on the evening news that, that we should have someone in our corner fighting for us. No, this idea, this, this comes from within. Even in our childhood, we know there should be a comforter here for me. Where's this idea come from? I would propose to you that Trinitarian theology not only is biblical and can make sense but it's, it's the hidden clues of it have been there all along. And so the next time you're thinking about the perfect dad or the older sibling or the person who's just near and dear when your heart's breaking or you're just feeling vulnerable, just remember that didn't come, that didn't come from your circumstances because you could still have an older sibling and you could have someone comfort you, but you still need somebody else that they are not. And no matter how great your dad is or was, there's still a father that you crave. And so I hope as uh, we kick off this series, I hope, I hope that um, that engages with you deeply. That as you think about the questions that we wrestle through in life, we, we have the willingness to step into some of these. And... Uh, and so with that in mind, our time is up, and I want to pray over us, and then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time you've allotted for us to be in this room, to gather together. I pray that something in the mix of this would encourage. Whether someone came into this room or is tuning in online and is skeptical about all of this, and that this is just pulls in just a little bit, made sense somewhat to them, or whether it's a long-time believer that's just looking for some nourishment. I pray that something said, something that was in this would be of encouragement. Lord, we thank you that we are made in your image. We're your offspring, and through Christ, we become your spiritual offspring. Through the work of Christ on the cross, you become Father, our Heavenly Father. And we thank you. We thank you for sending Christ. And Christ, we thank you for your work. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would draw ever near, fill us as we pursue you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. Have a great evening.